This is from my podcast, Down to Sleep, where I read books to help you get a good night's rest. You can listen for free here, Spotify, or other apps. Come and support the podcast on Patreon and get a bonus episode every single week. The Incident of Dr. Lanyon Time ran on. Thousands of pounds were offered in reward for the death of Sir Danvers was resented as a public injury. But Mr. Hyde had disappeared out of the ken of the police, as though he had never existed. Much of his past was unearthed, indeed, all disreputable. Tales came out of the man's cruelty, at once so callous and violent, of his vile life, of his strange associates, of the hatred that seemed to have surrounded his career. But of his present whereabouts, not a whisper. From the time he had left the house in Soho on the morning of the murder, he was simply blotted out. And gradually, as time drew on, Mr. Utterson began to recover from the hotness of his alarm, and to grow more at quiet with himself. The death of Sir Danvers was, to his way of thinking, more than paid for by the disappearance of Mr. Hyde. Now that the evil influence had been withdrawn, a new life began for Dr. Jekyll. He came out of his seclusion, renewed relations with his friends, became once more their familiar guest and entertainer. And whilst he had always been known for charities, he was now no less distinguished for religion. He was busy, he was much in the open air, he did good. His face seemed to open and brighten, as if with an inward consciousness of service, and for more than two months the doctor was at peace. On the 8th of January, Utterson had dined at the doctor's with a small party. Lanyon had been there, and the face of the host had looked from one to the other, as in the old days, when the trio were inseparable friends. On the 12th, and again on the 14th, the door was shut against the lawyer. The doctor was confined to the house, Poole said, and saw no one. On the 15th he tried again, and was again refused. Having now been used for the last two months to see his friend almost daily, he found his return of solitude to weigh upon his spirits. The fifth night he had in guests to dine with him, and the sixth he betook himself to Dr. Lanyon's. There, at least, he was not denied admittance, but when he came in he was shocked at the change which had taken place in the doctor's appearance. He had his death warrant written legibly upon his face. The rosy man had grown pale. His flesh had fallen away. He was visibly balder and older. And yet it was not so much these tokens of a swift physical decay that arrested the lawyer's notice as a look in the eye and quality of manner that seemed to testify to some deep-seated terror of the mind. It was unlikely that the doctor should fear death, and yet that was what Utterson was tempted to suspect. Yes, he thought, he is a doctor, he must know his own state and that his days are counted, and the knowledge is more than he can bear. And yet... When Utterson remarked on his ill looks, it was with an air of great firmness that Lanyon declared himself a doomed man. I have had a shock, he said, and I shall never recover. It is a question of weeks. Well, life has been pleasant. I liked it. Yes, sir, I used to like it. I sometimes think if we knew all we should be more glad to get away. Jekyll is ill, too, observed Utterson. Have you seen him? But Lanyon's face changed, and he held up a trembling hand. I wish to see or hear no more of Dr. Jekyll, he said in a loud, unsteady voice. I am quite done with that person, and I beg that you will spare me any allusion to one whom I regard as dead. Tut, tut, said Mr. Utterson. Then, after a considerable pause... Can't I do anything? We are three very old friends, Lanyon. 
We shall not live to make others. Nothing can be done, returned Lanyon. Ask himself. He will not see me, said the lawyer. I am not surprised at that, was the reply. Some day, Utterson, after I am dead, you may perhaps come to learn the right and wrong of this. I cannot tell you. And in the meantime, if you can sit and talk with me of other things, for God's sake, stay and do so. But if you cannot keep clear of this accursed topic, then in God's name go, for I cannot bear it. As soon as he got home, Utterson sat down and wrote to Jekyll, complaining of his exclusion from the house, asking the cause of this unhappy break with Lanyon, and the next day brought him a long answer, often very pathetically worded, sometimes darkly mysterious in drift. The quarrel with Lanyon was incurable. I do not blame our old friend, Jekyll wrote, but I share his view that we must never meet. I mean from henceforth to lead a life of extreme seclusion, you must not be surprised, nor must you doubt my friendship. If my door is often shut even to you, you must suffer me to go my own dark way. I have brought on myself a punishment and a danger that I cannot name. If I am the chief of sinners, I am the chief of sufferers also. I could not think that this earth contained a place for sufferings and terrors so unmanning. And you can do but one thing, Utterson, to lighten this destiny, and that is to respect my silence. Utterson was amazed. The dark influence of Hyde had been withdrawn. The doctor had returned to his old tasks in Amity's a week ago. The prospect had smiled with every promise of a cheerful and honoured age. And now, in a moment, friendship and peace of mind the whole tenor of his life were wrecked. So great and unprepared a change pointed to madness, but in view of Lanyon's manner and words, there must lie for it some deeper ground. A week afterwards, Dr. Lanyon took to his bed, and in something less than a fortnight, he was dead. The night after the funeral at which he had been sadly affected, Utterson locked the door of his business room and sitting there by the light of a melancholy candle, drew out and set before him an envelope addressed by the hand and sealed with the seal of his dead friend. Private, for the hands of G. J. Utterson alone, and in the case of his predecease, to be destroyed, unread. So it was emphatically superscribed, and the lawyer dreaded to behold the contents. I have buried one friend today, he thought. What if this should cost me another? And then he condemned the fear as a disloyalty and broke the seal. Within there was another enclosure likewise sealed and marked upon the cover, not to be opened till the death or disappearance of Dr. Henry Jekyll. Utterson could not trust his eyes. Yes, it was disappearance, here again as in the mad will which he had long ago restored to its author. Here again, the idea of a disappearance in the name of Henry Jekyll bracketed. But in the will, that idea had sprung from the sinister suggestion of the man Hyde. It was set there with a purpose all too plain and horrible. Written by the hand of Lanyon, what should it mean? A great curiosity came on the trustee to disregard the prohibition and dive at once to the bottom of these mysteries. But professional honour and faith to his dead friend were stringent obligations, and the packet slept in the inmost corner of his private safe. It is one thing to mortify curiosity, another to conquer it, and it may be doubted if, from that day forth, Utterson desired the society of his surviving friend with the same eagerness. He thought of him kindly, but his thoughts were disquieted and fearful. He went to call indeed, but he was perhaps relieved to be denied admittance. Perhaps in his heart he preferred to speak with Poole upon the doorstep and surrounded by the air and sounds of the open city. 
rather than be admitted into that house of voluntary bondage, to sit and speak with its inscrutable recluse. Poole had indeed no very pleasant news to communicate. The doctor, it appeared, now more than ever confined himself to the cabinet over the laboratory, where he would sometimes sleep. He was out of spirits. He had grown very silent. He did not read. It seemed as if he had something on his mind. Utterson became so used to the unvarying character of these reports that he fell off, little by little, in the frequency of his visits. Incident at the Window It chanced on Sunday, when Mr. Utterson was on his usual walk with Mr. Enfield, that their way lay once again through the by-street, and that when they came in front of the door both stopped to gaze on it. Well, said Enfield, that story is at an end at least. We shall never see more of Mr. Hyde. I hope not, said Utterson. Did I ever tell you that I once saw him, shared your feeling of repulsion? It's impossible to do the one without the other, returned Enfield. And by the way, what an ass you must have thought me, not to know that this was a back way to Dr. Jekyll's. It was partly your own fault that I found it out, even when I did. So you found it out, did you? said Utterson. But if that be so, we may step into the court and take a look at the windows. To tell you the truth, I'm uneasy about poor Jekyll. And even outside, I feel as if the presence of a friend might do him good. The court was very cool and a little damp, full of premature twilight although the sky high up overhead was still bright with sunset. The middle one of the three windows was halfway open, and sitting close beside it, taking the air with an infinite sadness of mien, like some disconsolate prisoner, Utterson saw Dr. Jekyll. "'What? Jekyll!' he cried. "'I trust you are better?' "'I am very low, Utterson,' replied the doctor drearily. Very low. It will not last long. Thank God. You stay too much indoors, said the lawyer. You should be out, whipping up the circulation like Mr. Enfield and me. Come now, get your hat. Take a quick turn with us. You're very good, sighed the other. I should like to very much, but... No, no, no. It is quite impossible. I dare not... But indeed, Utterson, I am very glad to see you. This is really a great pleasure. I would ask you and Mr. Enfield up, but the place is really not fit. Why then, said the lawyer good-naturedly, the best thing we can do is stay down here and speak with you from where we are. That is uh, just what I was about to venture to propose, returned the doctor with a smile. The words were hardly uttered before the smile was struck out of his face, and succeeded by an expression of such abject terror and despair as froze the very blood of the two gentlemen below. They saw it but for a glimpse, for the window was instantly thrust down. But that glimpse had been sufficient, and they turned and left the court without a word. In silence, too, they traversed the by-street, and it was not until they had come into a neighbouring thoroughfare, where even upon a Sunday there were still some stirrings of life, that Mr. Utson at last turned and looked at his companion. They were both pale, and there was an answering horror in their eyes. "'God forgive us, God forgive us,' said Mr. Utterson. But Mr. Enfield only nodded his head very seriously, and walked on once more, in silence. The last night. Mr. Utterson was sitting by his fireside one evening after dinner, when he was surprised to receive a visit from Poole. Bless me, Poole, what brings you here? he cried, and taking a second look at him. What ails you? Is the doctor ill? Mr. Utterson, said the man, there is something wrong. Take a seat, here is a glass of wine for you, said the lawyer. Take your time. Tell me plainly what you want. You know the doctor's ways, sir, 
replied Poole. How he shuts himself up. Well, he's shut up again in the cabinet, and I don't like it, sir. I wish I may die if I like it. Mr. Utterson, sir, I'm afraid. Now, my good man, said the lawyer, be explicit. What are you afraid of? I've been afraid for about a week, returned Poole, doggedly disregarding the question. I can bear it no more. The man's appearance amply wore out his words. His manner was altered for the worse, and except for the moment when he had first announced his terror, he had not once looked the lawyer in the face. Even now he sat with the glass of wine untasted on his knee, his eyes directed to a corner of the floor. I can bear it no more, he repeated. Come, said the lawyer. I see you have some good reason, Poole. I see there is something seriously amiss. Try to tell me what it is. I think there's been foul play, said Poole hoarsely. Foul play, cried the lawyer, a good deal frightened and rather inclined to be irritated in consequence. What foul play? What does the man mean? I don't say, sir. But will you come along with me and see for yourself? Mr. Utterson's only answer was to rise and get his hat and great coat, but he observed with wonder the greatness of the relief that appeared upon the butler's face. Perhaps with no less, the wine was still untasted when he set it down to follow. It was a wild, cold, seasonable night of March, with a pale moon lying on her back as though the wind had tilted her, a flying rack of the most diaphanous and lawny texture. The wind made talking difficult, and flecked the blood into the face. It seemed to have swept the streets unusually bare of passengers. Besides, for Mr. Utterson thought he had never seen that part of London so deserted. He could have wished it otherwise. Never in his life had he been conscious of so sharp a wish to see and touch his fellow creatures. For struggle as he might, there was borne in upon his mind a crushing anticipation of calamity. The square, when they got there, was full of wind and dust. The thin trees in the garden were lashing themselves along the railing. Poole, who had kept all the way a pace or two ahead, pulled up in the middle of the pavement, and in spite of the biting weather, took off his hat and mopped his brow with a red pocket handkerchief. For all the hurry of his coming, these were not the dews of exertion that he wiped away. The moisture of some strangling anguish. His face was white and his voice when he spoke was harsh and broken. Well, sir, he said, here we are, and God grant there be nothing wrong. Amen, Paul, said the lawyer. Thereupon the servant knocked in a very guarded manner. The door was opened on the chain, and a voice asked from within, Is that you, Paul? It's all right, said Paul. Open the door. The hall, when they entered it, was brightly lighted up. The fire was built high in the hearth, and the whole of the servants, men and women, stood huddled together like a flock of sheep. At the sight of Mr. Utterson, the housemaid broke into hysterical whimpering, and the cook crying out, Bless God, it's Mr. Utterson! He ran forward as if to take him in her arms. What? "'Are you all here?' said the lawyer peevishly. "'Very irregular, very unseemly. Your master would be far from pleased.' "'They're all afraid,' said Poole. Blank silence followed. No one protesting, only the maid lifted her voice and now wept loudly. "'Hold your tongue,' Poole said to her with a ferocity of accent that testified to his own jangled nerves. And indeed, when the girl had so suddenly raised the note of her lamentation— they had all started and turned towards the inner door, with faces of dreadful expectation. And now, continued the butler addressing the knife boy, reach me a candle, and we'll get this through hands at once. He begged Mr. Utterson to follow him and led the way to the back garden. Now, sir, said he, you come as gently as you can. I want you to hear, and I don't want you to be heard. And see here, sir, if by any chance he was to ask you to go in, don't go. Mr. Utterson's nerves, 
at this unlooked-for termination, gave a jerk that nearly threw him from his balance. He recollected his courage and followed the butler into the laboratory building, through the surgical theatre, with its lumber of crates and bottles to the foot of the stair. Here Poole motioned him to stand to one side and listen, while he himself, setting down the candle and making a great and obvious call on his resolution, mounted the steps and knocked with a somewhat uncertain hand on the red cabinet door. "'Mr. Utterson, sir, asking to see you,' he called. Even as he did so, once more violently signed to the lawyer to give ear. A voice answered from within. "'Tell him I cannot see anyone,' it said complainingly. "'Thank you, sir,' said Paul, with a note of something like triumph in his voice. Taking up his candle, he led Mr. Utterson back across the yard into the great kitchen." where the fire was out and the beetles were leaping on the floor. Sir, he said, looking Mr. Utterson in the eyes, was that my master's voice? It seems much changed, replied the lawyer, very pale but giving look for look. Changed? Well, yes, I think so, said the butler. Have I been twenty years in the man's house to be deceived about his voice? No, sir. Master's made away with. He was made away with eight days ago, when we heard him cry upon the name of God. Who's in there instead of him? Why it stays there is a thing that cries to heaven, Mr. Utterson. This is a very strange tale, Paul. This is a rather wild tale, my man, said Mr. Utterson, biting his finger. Suppose it were, as you suppose, supposing Dr. Jekyll to have been, well, murdered. What could induce the murderer to stay? That won't hold water. Doesn't commend itself to reason. Well, Mr. Utterson, you are a hard man to satisfy, but I'll do it yet, said Paul. All this last week, you must know, him or it, whatever it is that lives in the cabinet, has been crying night and day for some sort of medicine and cannot get it to his mind. It was sometimes his way. The master's, that is, to write his orders on a sheet of paper and throw it on the stair. We've had nothing else this week back. Nothing but papers and a closed door and the very meals left there to be smuggled in when nobody was looking. Well, sir, every day, twice and thrice in the same day, there have been orders and complaints, and I have been sent flying to all the wholesale chemists in town. Every time I brought the stuff back, there would be another paper telling me to return it, because it was not pure, and order another from a different firm. This drug is wanted, bitter bad, sir, whatever for. Have you any of these papers? asked Mr. Utterson. Poole felt in his pocket and handed out a crumpled note, which the lawyer, bending nearer to the candle, carefully examined. Its contents ran thus. Dr. Jekyll presents his compliments. He assures them that their last sample is impure and quite useless for his present purpose. In the year 18, Dr. J purchased a somewhat large quantity. He now begs them to search with much care. Should any of the same quality be left, forward it to him at once. Expense is no consideration. The importance of this to Dr. J can hardly be exaggerated. So far the letter had run composedly enough, but here, with a sudden splutter of the pen, the writer's emotion had broken loose. For God's sake, he added, find me some of the old. This is a strange note, said Mr. Utterson. How do you come to have it open? The man at Moore's was made angry, sir. He threw it back at me, like so much dirt. This is unquestionably the doctor's hand, do you know? resumed the lawyer. I thought it looked like it, said the servant rather sulkily, and with another voice. But what matters, hand of right? I've seen him. Seen him, replied Mr. Utterson. Well? That's it, said Paul. It was this way. I came suddenly into the theatre from the garden. It seems he had slipped out to look for this drug, or whatever it is. The cabinet door was open. 
there he was at the far end of the room, digging among the crates. He looked up when I came in and gave a kind of cry and whipped upstairs into the cabinet. I was but for one minute that I saw him. The hair stood upon my head like quills. Sir, if that was my master, why had he a mask upon his face? If it was my master, why did he cry out like a rat and run from me? I've served him long enough, and then... The man paused and passed his hand over his face. These are all very strange circumstances, said Mr. Utterson. But I think I begin to see daylight. Your master, Poole, is plainly seized with one of these maladies that both torture and deform the sufferer. Hence, for aught I know, the alteration of his voice, hence the mask and the avoidance of his friends, hence his eagerness to find the drug, by means of which the poor soul retains some hope of ultimate recovery. God grant he not be deceived, there is my explanation. It is sad enough, Paul I, and appalling to consider, but it is plain and natural, hangs well together and delivers us from all exorbitant alarms. Sir, said the butler, turning to a sort of mottled pallor. That thing was not my master, and there's the truth. My master? Here he looked around him and began to whisper, is a tall, fine build of a man. This was more of a dwarf. Utterson attempted to protest. Sir, cried Paul, do you think I do not know my master after twenty years? Do you think I do not know where his head comes to in the cabinet door where I saw him every morning of my life? No, sir. That thing in the mask was never Dr. Jekyll. God knows what it was, but it was never Dr. Jekyll, and it is the belief of my heart that there was murder done. Poole, replied the lawyer, if you say that it will become my duty to make certain. Much as I desire to spare your master's feelings, much as I am puzzled by this note, which seems to prove him to be still alive, I shall consider it my duty to break in that door. Mr. Utterson, that's talking, cried the butler. And now comes the second question, resumed Utterson. Who is going to do it? Why, you and me, sir, was the undaunted reply. That's very well said, returned the lawyer. And whatever comes of it, I shall make it my business to see you a no loser. There's an axe in the theatre, continued Paul, and you might take the kitchen poker for yourself. The lawyer took that rude but weighty instrument into his hand and balanced it. Do you know, Paul, he said, looking up, you and I are about to place ourselves in a position of some peril. You may say so, sir, indeed, returned the butler. It is well, then, that we should be frank, said the other. We both think more than we have said. Let us make a clean breast. This masked figure that you saw, did you recognize it? Well, sir, it went so quick, and the creature was so doubled up that I could hardly swear to it. But if you mean, was it Mr. Hyde? Why, yes, I think it was. You see, it was much of the same bigness, and it had the same quick, light way with it. Then who else could have gotten into the laboratory door? You've not forgot, sir, that at the time of the murder he had still the key with him? But that's not all. I don't know, Mr. Rutterson, have you ever met this Mr. Hyde? Yes, said the lawyer. I once spoke with him. Then you must know as well as the rest of us. Then you must know as well as the rest of us. There was something queer about that gentleman. Something that gave a man a turn. I don't know rightly how to say it, sir. Beyond this, you felt in your marrow kind of cold and thin. I own I felt something of what you describe, said Mr. Rutterson. Quite so, sir returned Poole. Well, when that masked thing like a monkey jumped from among the chemicals and whipped into the cabinet, it went down my spine like ice. I know it's not evidence, Mr. Utterson, I'm book learned enough for that. But a man has his feelings, and I give you my Bible word. It was Mr. Hyde. Aye, aye, said the lawyer. My fears incline to the same point. Evil, I fear, founded. Evil was sure to come of that connection. 
I... Truly, I believe you. I believe poor Harry is killed. And I believe his murderer, for what purpose God alone can tell, is still lurking in his victim's room. Well, let our name be Vengeance. Call Bradshaw. The footman came at the summons, very white and nervous. Pull yourself together, Bradshaw, said the lawyer. This suspense, I know, is telling upon all of you, but it is now our intention to make an end of it. Paul here and I are going to force our way into the cabinet. If all is well, my shoulders are broad enough to bear the blame. Meanwhile, lest anything should really be amiss, or any malefactor seek to escape by the back, you and the boy must go round the corner with a pair of good sticks and take your post at the laboratory door. We give you ten minutes to get to your stations. As Bradshaw left, the lawyer looked at his watch. And now, Paul, let us get to ours. Taking the poker under his arm led the way into the yard. The scud had banked over the moon, and it was now quite dark. The wind, which only broke in puffs and draughts into that deep well of a building, tossed the light of the candle to and fro about their steps until they came into the shelter of the theatre, where they sat down silently to wait. London hummed solemnly all around, but nearer at hand the stillness was only broken by the sounds of a footfall moving to and fro along the cabinet floor. "'So it will walk all day, sir,' whispered Paul, "'and the better part of the night.' Only when a new sample comes from the chemist, there's a bit of a break. It's an ill conscience that's such an enemy to rest. Sir, there's blood foully shed in every step of it, but hark again a little closer. Put your heart in your ears, Mr. Utterson. Tell me, is that the doctor's foot? The steps fell lightly and oddly with a certain swing, for all they went so slowly. It was different indeed from the heavy, creaking tread of Henry Jekyll. Utterson sighed. Is there never anything else? he asked. Paul nodded. Once, he said. Once I heard it weeping. Weeping? How's that? said the lawyer, conscious of a sudden chill of horror. Weeping like a woman or a lost soul, said the butler. I came away with that upon my heart that I could have wept too. But now the ten minutes drew to an end. Poole disinterred the axe from under a stack of packing straw. The candle was set upon the nearest table to light them to the attack. And they drew near with bated breath to where that patient foot was still going, up and down, up and down, in the quiet of the night. Jekyll, cried Utterson with a loud voice, I demand to see you. He paused a moment, but there came no reply. I give you fair warning. Our suspicions are aroused, and I must and shall see you. If not by fair means, then by foul. If not of your consent, then by brute force. Utterson, said the voice, for God's sake, have mercy. That's not Jekyll's voice. It's Hyde's, cried Utterson. Down with the door, Paul. Paul swung the axe over his shoulder. The blow shook the building. The red door leaped against the lock and hinges. A dismal screech, as of mere animal terror, rang from the cabinet. Up went the axe again, and again the panels crashed and the frame bounded. Four times the blow fell, but the wood was tough and the fittings were of excellent workmanship and it was not until the fifth that the lock burst and the wreck of the door fell inwards on the carpet. The besiegers, appalled by their own riot and the stillness that had succeeded, stood back a little and peered in. There lay the cabinet before their eyes in the quiet lamplight, a good fire glowing and chattering on the hearth, the kettle singing its thin strain, a drawer or two open, papers neatly set forth on the business table. Nearer the fire, things laid out for tea. The quietest room, you would have said, and but for the glazed presses full of chemicals, the most commonplace that night in London. 
Right in the middle there lay the body of a man, sorely contorted and still twitching. They drew near on tiptoe, turned it on its back, and beheld the face of Edward Hyde. He was dressed in clothes far too large for him, clothes of the doctor's bigness. The cords of his face still moved with semblance of life, but life was quite gone. By the crushed file in the hand and the strong smell of kernels that hung upon the air, Utterson knew he was looking on the body of a self-destroyer. "'We've come too late,' he said sternly. "'Whether to save or punish, Hyde is gone to his account, and it only remains for us to find the body of your master.' The far greater proportion of the building was occupied by the theatre, which filled almost the whole ground story, and was lighted from above and by the cabinet, which formed an upper story at one end and looked upon the court. A corridor joined the theatre to the door on the by-street, and with this the cabinet communicated separately by a second flight of stairs. There were besides a few dark closets and a spacious cellar, all these they now thoroughly examined. Each closet needed but a glance, for all were empty, and all by the dust that fell from their doors had stood long unopened. The cellar indeed was filled with crazy lumber, mostly dating from the times of the surgeon who was Jekyll's predecessor. Even as they opened the door they were advertised of the uselessness of further search, by the fall of a perfect mat of cobweb, which had for years sealed the entrance. Nowhere was there any trace of Henry Jekyll, dead or alive. Poole stamped on the flags of the corridor. He must be buried here, he said. Or he may have fled, said Utterson. He turned to examine the door to the by-street. It was locked, and lying nearby on the flags they found the key already stained with rust. This does not look like use, observed the lawyer. Use, echoed Paul. Do you not see, sir? It is broken, much as if a man had stamped on it. I continued Utterson, and the fractures, too, are rusty. The two men looked at each other with a scare. This is beyond me, Paul. Let us get back to the cabinet. They mounted the stair in silence, and still with an occasional awestruck glance at the dead body, proceeded more thoroughly to examine the contents of the cabinet. At one table there were traces of chemical work, various measured heaps of some white salt being laid on glass saucers, as though for an experiment in which the unhappy man had been prevented. "'That's the same drug that I was always bringing him,' said Paul. Even as he spoke, the kettle, with a startling noise, boiled over. This brought them to the fireside." where the easy chair was drawn cosily up, and the tea things stood ready to the sitter's elbow, the very sugar in the cup. There were several books on the shelf. One lay beside the tea things open, and Utterson was amazed to find it a copy of a pious work, for which Jekyll had several times expressed great esteem, annotated in his own hand with startling blasphemies. Next, in the course of their review of the chamber, the searchers came to the shovel glass, into whose depths they looked with an involuntary horror. But it was so turned as to show them nothing but the rosy glow playing on the roof, the fire sparkling in a hundred repetitions along the glazed front of the presses, and their own pale and fearful countenances stooping to look in. This glass has seen some strange things, sir, whispered Paul. And surely none stranger than itself, echoed the lawyer in the same tone. For what did Jekyll? He caught himself up at the word with a start, and then conquering the weakness. What could Jekyll want with it? You may say that, said Poole. Next they turned to the business table. On the desk, among the neat array of papers, a large envelope was uppermost and bore in the doctor's hand the name of Mr. Utterson. The lawyer unsealed it. Several enclosures fell to the floor. The first was a will, 
drawn in the same eccentric terms as the one which he had returned six months before, to serve as testament in case of death, as a deed of gift in case of disappearance. But in place of the name of Edward Hyde, the lawyer, with indescribable amazement, read the name of Gabriel John Utterson. He looked at Poole and back at the paper, and last of all at the dead malefactor stretched upon the carpet. My head goes round, he said. He has been all these days in possession. He had no cause to like me. He must have raged to see himself displaced, and he has not destroyed this document. He caught up the next paper. It was a brief note in the doctor's hand and dated at the top. Oh, Paul, the lawyer cried. He was alive and here this day. He cannot have been disposed of in so short a space. He must still be alive. He must have fled. Why fled? How? And in that case, can we venture to declare this suicide? We must be careful. I foresee that we may yet involve your master in some dire catastrophe. Why don't you read it, sir? asked Paul. Because I fear, replied the lawyer solemnly. God grant I have no cause for it. And with that, he brought the paper to his eyes and read as follows. My dear Utterson, when this shall fall into your hands, I shall have disappeared. Under what circumstances I have not the penetration to foresee. But my instinct and all the circumstances of my nameless situation tell me that the end is sure and must be early. Go then, first read the narrative which Lanyon warned me he was to place in your hands. If you care to hear more, turn to the confession of your unworthy and unhappy friend, Henry Jekyll. There was a third enclosure, asked Utterson. Here, sir, said Paul, and gave into his hands a considerable packet sealed in several places. The lawyer put it in his pocket. I would say nothing of this paper. If your master has fled or is dead, we may at least save his credit. It's now ten. I must go home and read these documents in quiet but I shall be back before midnight, where we shall send for the police. They went out, locking the door of the theatre behind them, and Utterson once more leaving the servants gathered around the fire in the hall, trudged back to his office to read the two narratives in which this mystery was to be explained. Dr. Lanyon's Narrative On the 9th of January, now four days ago, I received by the evening delivery a registered envelope addressed in the hand of my colleague and old school companion, Henry Jekyll. I was a good deal surprised by this, for we were by no means in the habit of correspondence. I had seen the man, dined with him indeed, the night before, and I could imagine nothing in our intercourse that should justify formality of registration. The contents increased my wonder, for this is how the letter ran. Dear Lanyon, you are one of my oldest friends, and although we may have differed at times on scientific questions, I cannot remember, at least on my side, any break in our affection. There was never a day when, if you had said to me, Jekyll, my life, my honour, my reason depend upon you, that I would not have sacrificed my left hand to help you. Lanyon, my life, my honour, my reason are all at your mercy. If you fail me tonight, I am lost. You might suppose after this preface that I am going to ask you for something dishonorable to grant. Judge for yourself. I want you to postpone all other engagements for tonight. I, even if you were summoned to the bedside of an emperor, to take a cab unless your carriage should actually be at the door, and with this letter in your hand for consultation, Drive straight to my house. Poole, my butler, has his orders. You will find him waiting your arrival with the locksmith. The door of my cabinet is then to be forced. You are to go in alone, to open the glazed press on the left hand. Break the lock if it be shut, and draw out with all its contents as they stand the fourth drawer from the top. In my extreme distress of mind, I have a morbid fear of misdirecting you, but even if I am in error, you may know the right drawer by its contents. 
some powders, a file, a paper book. This drawer I beg you to carry back with you to Cavendish Square exactly as it stands. That is the first part of the service, now for the second. You should be back if you set out at once on the receipt of this long before midnight, but I will leave you that amount of margin. Not only in the fear of one of those obstacles that neither can be prevented nor foreseen, but because an hour when your servants are in bed is to be preferred for what will then remain to do. At midnight, then, I have to ask you to be alone in your consulting room, to admit with your own hand into the house a man who will present himself in my name, to place in his hands the drawer that you will have brought you from my cabinet. Then you will have played your part and earned my gratitude completely. Five minutes afterwards, if you insist upon an explanation, you will have understood that these arrangements are of capital importance. Find that by the neglect of one of them, fantastic as they must appear, you might have charged your conscience with my death or the shipwreck of my reason. Confident as I am that you will not trifle with this appeal, my heart sinks and my hand trembles at the bare thought of such a possibility. Think of me at this hour in a strange place, laboring under a blackness of distress that no fancy can exaggerate, and yet well aware that if you will but punctually serve me, my troubles will roll away like a story that is told. Serve me, my dear Lanyon, and save your friend, Henry Jackal. P.S. I had already sealed this up when a fresh terror struck upon my soul. It is possible that the post office may fail me. This letter may not come into your hands until tomorrow morning. In that case, dear Lanyon, do my errand when it shall be most convenient for you in the course of the day. Once more expect my messenger at midnight. It may then already be too late, and if the night passes without event, you will know that you have seen the last of Henry Jekyll. Upon the reading of this letter, I made sure my colleague was insane. But till that was proved beyond possibility of a doubt, I felt bound to do as he requested. The less I understood of this farrago, the less I was in a position to judge of its importance. An appeal so worded could not be set aside without a grave responsibility. I rose accordingly from the table, got into a hansom and drove straight to Jekyll's house. The butler was awaiting my arrival. He had received by the same post as mine a registered letter of instruction, and had sent at once for a locksmith and a carpenter. The tradesmen came while we were yet speaking, and we moved in a body to old Dr. Denman's surgical theatre, from which, as you are doubtless aware, Jekyll's private cabinet is most conveniently entered. The door was very strong, the lock excellent. The carpenter avowed he would have great trouble and have to do more damage, if force would be used. The locksmith was near despair, but the last was a handy fellow, and after two hours' work the door stood open. The press marked E was unlocked, and I took out the drawer, had it filled with straw, tied in a sheet, and returned with it to Cavendish Square. Here I proceeded to examine its contents. The powders were neatly enough made up, but not with the nicety of the dispensing chemist, so it was plain they were of Jekyll's private manufacture. When I opened one of the wrappers, I found what seemed to me a simple crystalline salt of a white colour. The phial to which I next turned my attention might have been about half full of blood-red liquor, which was highly pungent to the sense of smell and seemed to me to contain phosphorus and some volatile ether. At the other ingredients I could make no guess. The book was an ordinary version book and contained little but a series of dates. These covered a period of many years, but I observed that the entries ceased nearly a year ago and quite abruptly. Here and there a brief remark was appended to a date, usually no more than a single word, double, occurring perhaps six times in a total of several hundred entries, and once very early in the list, followed by several marks of exclamation, total failure. All this, though, whetted my curiosity, told me little that was definite. Here were a file of some sort and the record of a series of experiments that had led, like too many of Jekyll's investigations, to no end of practical usefulness. How could the presence of these articles in my house affect either the honour, sanity, or life of my flighty colleague? 
If his messenger could go to one place, why could he not go to another? Even granting some impediment, why was this gentleman to be received by me in secret? The more I reflected, the more convinced I grew that I was dealing with a case of cerebral disease, and though I dismissed my servants to bed, I loaded an old revolver, that I might be found in some posture of self-defense. Twelve o'clock had scarce rung out over London. The knocker sounded very gently on the door. I went myself at the summons and found a small man crouching against the pillars of the portico. Are you come from Dr. Jekyll? I asked. He told me, yes, by a constrained gesture. When I had bidden him enter, he did not obey me without a searching backward glance into the darkness of the square. There was a policeman not far off, advancing with his bullseye open, and at the sight I thought my visitor started and made greater haste. These particulars struck me, I confess, disagreeably. As I followed him into the bright light of the consulting room, I kept my hand ready on my weapon. Here at last I had a chance of clearly seeing him. I had never set eyes on him before. He was small, as I have said. I was struck, besides, with the shocking expression of his face, his remarkable combination of great muscular activity and great apparent debility of constitution. And last but not least the odd subjective disturbance caused by his neighbourhood. This bore some resemblance to incipient rigour, and was accompanied by a marked sinking of the pulse. At the time I set it down to some idiosyncratic personal distaste, and merely wondered at the acuteness of the symptoms. But I have since had reason to believe the cause to lie much deeper in the nature of man, to turn on some nobler hinge than the principle of hatred. This person, who had thus from the first moment of his entrance struck in me what I can only describe as a disgraceful curiosity, was dressed in a fashion that would have made an ordinary person laughable. His clothes, that is to say, although they were of rich and sober fabric, were enormously too large for him in every measurement, the trousers hanging on his legs and rolled up to keep them from the ground the waist of the coat below his haunches, the collar sprawling wide upon his shoulders. Strange to relate, this was far from moving me to laughter, rather as there was something abnormal and misbegotten in the very essence of the creature that now faced me. Something seizing, surprising, and revolting. This fresh disparity seemed but to fit in with and to reinforce it, so that to my interest in the man's nature and character... There was added curiosity as to his origin, his life, his fortune and status in the world. These observations, though they have taken so great a space to be set down in, were yet the work of a few seconds. My visitor was indeed on fire with sombre excitement. Have you got it? he cried. Have you got it? And so lively was his impatience that he even laid his hand upon my arm and sought to shake me. I put him back, conscious at his touch of a certain icy pang along my blood. Come, sir, said I, you forget that I have not yet the pleasure of your acquaintance. Be seated. I beg your pardon, Dr. Lanyon, he replied civilly enough. What you say is very well founded. My impatience has shown its heels to my politeness. I come here at the instance of your colleague, Dr. Henry Jekyll, on a piece of business of some moment, and I understood... He paused and put his hand to his throat, and I could see in spite of his collected manner that he was wrestling against the approaches of hysteria. I understood a draw, but here I took pity on my visitor's suspense and some perhaps on my own growing curiosity. There it is, sir, I said, pointing to the drawer, where it lay on the floor behind a table and covered with the sheet. He sprang to it and paused, laid his hand upon his heart. I could hear his teeth grate with the convulsive action of his jaws. His face was so ghastly to see that I grew alarmed both for life and reason. Compose yourself, said I. He turned a dreadful smile to me, and as if with the decision of despair plucked away the sheet. At sight of the contents he uttered one loud sob of such immense relief that I sat petrified. 
the next moment in a voice that was already fairly well under control. "'Have you a graduated glass?' he asked. I rose from my place with something of an effort and gave him what he asked. He thanked me with a smiling nod, measured out a few minims of the red tincture and added one of the powders. The mixture, which was at first of a reddish hue, began, in proportion as the crystals melted, to brighten in colour, to throw off small fumes of vapour. Suddenly and at the same moment the ebullition ceased and the compound changed to a dark purple, which faded again more slowly to a watery green. My visitor, who had watched these metamorphoses with a keen eye, smiled, set down the glass upon the table, and then turned and looked upon me with an air of scrutiny. And now, said he, to settle what remains, will you be wise? Will you be guided? Will you suffer me to take this glass in my hand, and to go forth from your house without further parley? Or has the greed of curiosity too much command of you? Think before you answer, for it shall be done as you decide. As you decide, you shall be left as you were before, and neither richer nor wiser, unless the sense of service rendered to a man in mortal distress may be counted as a kind of riches of the soul. Or, if you shall so prefer to choose... A new province of knowledge and avenues to fame and power shall be laid upon you, here, in this room, upon the instant. Your sight shall be blasted by a prodigy to stagger the unbelief of Satan. Sir, said I, affecting a coolness that I was far from truly possessing, you speak enigmas, and you will perhaps not wonder that I hear you with no very strong impression of belief but I've gone too far in the way of inexplicable services to pause before I see the end. It is well, replied the visitor. Lanyon, you remember your vows. What follows is under the seal of our profession. And now, you who have so long been bound to the most narrow and material views, you who have denied the virtue of transcendental medicine, you who have derided your superiors, Behold, he put the glass to his lips and drank at one gulp. A cry followed. He reeled, staggered, clutched at the table and held on, staring with injected eyes, gasping with open mouth, and as I looked there came a thought, a change. He seemed to swell, his face became suddenly black, the features melted and altered. The next moment I had sprung to my feet and leapt back against the wall, my arms raised to shield me from that prodigy, my mind submerged in terror. Oh God, I screamed, oh God, again and again, for there before my eyes, pale and shaken, half fainting and groping before him with his hands like a man restored from death, there stood Henry Jekyll. What he told me in the next hour I cannot bring my mind to set on paper. I saw what I saw, I heard what I heard. My soul sickened at it. And yet now, when that sight has faded from my eyes, I ask myself if I believe it, and I cannot answer. My life is shaken to its roots. Sleep has left me. The deadliest terror sits by me at all hours of the day and night. I feel that my days are numbered, that I must die. And yet I shall die incredulous. As for the moral turpitude that man unveiled to me even with tears of penitence, I cannot even in my memory dwell on it without a start of horror. I will say but one thing, Utterson, and that, if you can bring your mind to credit it, will be more than enough. The creature who crept into my house that night was, on Jekyll's own confession, known by the name of Hyde and hunted for in every corner of the land as the murderer of Carew. And that is where we close the book on this episode and on Jekyll and Hyde.